some lunatic started hoarding toilet paper and caused a mass a mass panic, which um, was probably the best thing that ever happened to our brand. If there's no toilet paper, you got to clean your butt somehow. And people started turning towards the bidet. So we saw a huge influx in sales. I mean, it was Black Friday every day for seven days. We actually sold out a product. So it was a, a true testament to the fact that you can hear about a brand for the first time on a podcast, sit on that knowledge, and then once something pushes you to buy, you go back to the website that you heard, and that's that's where you make that uh, informed and, um, in this case, desperate purchase, but still, uh, we'll take that. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today we're in the tank with Thomas Latrecchiano, co-founder of Omigo, the toilet from the future. Thomas is the younger half of a father-son duo building an empire around bidets and the notion that you should wash, not wipe. Thomas heads up growth for the fast-growing Omigo, so this interview I picked his brain on the most effective ways to educate your audience on new concepts, the value of landing pages for customer experience and conversion percentage, how Omigo tests their website with tools as well as real users, why Omigo switched to all video assets, and why their founder video is still the number one asset across all sources. How do you go about justifying Facebook's budgets with seven-day attribution windows, why podcasts work, and why it didn't look like they did at first for Omigo? On with the show. How did Gymshark win 2020? Consumer research. They worked with a test to learn more about their audience's changing habits then pivoted their business to meet those needs. Visit askatest.com slash D2C and use fast, accurate consumer research to get ahead. It's growth without guesswork. Welcome to the podcast, Thomas. Can you uh, let me know uh, what is the most difficult thing about selling bidets to Americans? Oh, man. Where to begin? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, and... nice to be here. <laughs> Uh, the most difficult thing about selling the days to Americans is probably the fact that most of them haven't used them before. So to educate them is the most difficult thing, um, to help them understand how much better it is than wiping with toilet paper, um, is a difficult thing to understand if you've never used one before. So, uh, that's definitely up there. And where in the world right now are, is there, uh, you know, a lot of bidets? Uh, so actually there's a law in Italy, I believe, where now you have to build, I mean, I think since the nineties, uh, you have to build a home, uh, with the ability to have a bidet installed in your bathroom. So they're all over Italy. I mean, all over Europe and we're talking traditional bidets there where it's a separate giant porcelain fixture and you waddle over and, uh, you know, you can use your hand or it's a, a basin. Um, but then in Southeast Asia, they have a different type of bidet um, or a bucket with a ladle, which is a super, I think, I forget what that's called specifically. Um, but in Japan, bidet toilet seats, like our luxury bidet um, at Amigo, they're more common than dishwashers in Japan. So they are ubiquitous over there. Everyone has one. Totally. Yeah. My first experience uh, with a bidet was in a Korean home in 2003. It was the middle of the night. I got up. I just was overwhelmed by the amount of buttons on the thing. And I ended up, uh, you know, pushing one and, you know, just spraying the ceiling and I've got my hand over. It was a really kind of, uh, you know, comical sort of uh, experience. Of course, there's a flush on the side. That's what you use. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand it is. It's funny. Like when the, I was just looking it up the flush toilet was invented in 1596. And this, like, what, you know, what our toilet experience is hasn't changed for literally centuries. Um, so it's got, so I imagine education is going to be the, you know, one of the biggest challenges. So what, uh, what has been some of your biggest wins when it comes to tackling this biggest challenge of educating people about how much better the days are? Yeah. So early on, um, we were a bit hesitant to really tell people exactly how the bidet works because it's kind of an intimidating topic. Um, for a newcomer um, and some of the biggest wins on site were realizing how much people wanted to know and wanted to learn about bidets because 
in order for them to be comfortable buying one, um, you know, they were going to have to be completely educated on the topic to a point at least where they're okay to try one for the first time. Um, so one of the biggest wins was actually extending our funnel and putting in a really nice long detail page in between our product page and our home page. And we point uh, most of our traffic there that lands on our home page is funneled into that detail page so that you can really educate yourself at your own pace um, and learn whatever topic that you'd like to learn specifically about how a bidet works. Uh, so letting the customer kind of guide themselves in the journey was a huge win for us um, on site. And that, that's a traditional long form sales page, it looks like. Um, I'm just on it now. It's just got all all sorts of great elements and you can just, yeah, it's, you sort of scroll on it endlessly. Uh, great. And that has really, so, so describe the impact that, that 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 had, like putting that page in there. Yeah, so, um, I mean, time on site went up um, and it's actually a very good middle of funnel page for us. So top of funnel, we learned it's a little bit too much too fast. Um, but once you already are familiar with the brand, if we send you back to the detail page, it can be a great um, secondary visit to conversion uh, type of uh, funnel page. Uh, so it's been nice to actually watch people in user testing navigate that page um, early on and be able to adjust and change it to, to what they are asking questions about while they're kind of doing this self-recorded user testing and be able to hone in the messaging on site. That's very cool. What, what tool did you use for that? Um, so we use, oh man, um, we use respondent.io. And then most recently I started using, um, I think it's user brain. I'd very have to cool. double check on that. And what is it, so are there heat maps involved in that? Like finding where people's attention is going on the site and kind of building around that? Like what are the actual signals you're getting to, to help you build this page better over time? Yeah, so um, we do use Hotjar, which is a heat map tool, um, which is just a snippet you put on your site and then it records how far down the page people scroll. So it gives you a heat map on their scroll. Um, it gives you a tap map on mobile so you can see where they're tapping. Uh, allows you to see what buttons they're touching if they're trying to tap a certain element to learn more if it's intuitive for them to touch there um, and then on desktop it actually gives you a mouse pointer um, kind of scroll map so you can see where people kind of read and highlight with the mouse as they go along um, along Very with cool. the other two uh, so we do use a um, hot jar heat map for partial of this and that kind of that really allows us to hone in what we want to use for user testing but the user testing is actually a video format so um, we've done a guided interview where we sit down one-on-one -on -one like this and over a zoom call and say give them a prompt say hey you're shopping for a bidet you come across amigo let's go to the site and then um, say everything that comes to mind uh, so we actually let them navigate kind of host them through and guide them um, to different pages or listen to what they're saying. Um, and so that, that was our first round. And then most recently we did a self-guided test, which was pretty interesting to see the difference between the two. Um, but it's been really informative and educational and formative for our site. And when you bring people in like that, do you separate them into people who are, you know, category aware versus people who are not? Yeah, so... Or is most everyone category aware at this point, would you say? Most people know of know what a bidet is, um, and I think so. It's yeah. a little bit self selective, right? So if you're on the on this website and you're scrolling through different tasks and you see bidet or butt washing or whatever the clever title is that I put up that time, then you know yep. you might already be familiar. So I think it's a little bit self selective with people who know what bidets are, um, but we do have a kind of qualifying questionnaire in there where I ask. Um, do you own a bidet or have you ever used a bidet? What are the three words that come to mind? Uh, what was your experience with a bidet? Uh, and that don't, not only lets me put them into two buckets while I'm doing user testing, but it also gives me a little bit of insight on like average people's view of what a bidet is and how it works. Very cool. And this is the quiz that, that users can find on site. 
Uh, no, this is actually kind of pre-qualifying questions to user testing. Oh, to user testing. Got it. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Um, now, about I was wondering about the quiz. I'm, I'm, I was on the, the landing page here. How important has the quiz been to the customer journey? Yeah, the quiz is relatively new. I want to say it's about only two months old on the site. And um, it's been an interesting early version of the quiz. So got it. What we found again uh, to use the word again, the self selection. So we don't really push it onto people. There is a nice big button on the home page and there's a button in the navigation that um, excuse me, users can kind of find on their own. You know, if mm -hmm. you're if you're navigating the site and you find it on your own and you are at that kind of level of awareness of of, you know, I know what a bidet is, I understand this, what is what is the choice for me? Um, it's been nice to see the fact that there have been conversions that come from people taking the quiz um, and also a lot of email capture. And actually mm -hmm. the email capture, um, the emails that we capture from people taking the quiz convert at an extremely high rate in our welcome series flow. So. Uh, we find that those people who have gone through the quiz um, start getting our emails. It's just a matter of time before they, they come back to the site. That's interesting. Have you ever tried running it top of funnel? Uh, we did try it direct uh, as a landing page from a Facebook ad. And it just, I don't think we quite got that formulation right of what mm. kind of hook we want as an image. Um, and it just wasn't quite right. For, for that purpose. Uh, I think we'll revisit that someday soon. Uh, maybe when we have a little bit more name recognition and try it middle of funnel. Um, but it, it really wasn't our top of funnel choice. Nice. Now I know you're intimately involved with the growth uh, at the company. Um, and I, so I know, I, and I know you, you do, you let you work with agencies, but I know you probably have your hands on things to, to a large extent as well. What, what's the state of the union right now? Uh, let's say in Facebook and Instagram ads. The state of the union. Well, my fellow D to C marketers, um, no, um, it is a state of new learning mixed with disarray. I would say um, things are not when, what they once were, and I think we are all still scrambling a bit to get our feet under us and really understand the true impact um, of how it's going to be a part of our marketing mix. And do you think it's also possible that it was also not quite what we thought it was originally? Do you think there's a little bit of that as well that's happening, uh, coming in from the other side in that, you know, we were probably seeing Facebook over attribute things before? Or not? Let me see. I I think it's a little bit of both. Yes, I would I would say that they may be over attributing in the past. Also, I just don't think that we have the same capability of the retargeting we used to because you know you used to be able to chase people down for thirty days, um, but now it resets over seven days, and if they come back in your funnel, you don't know if they have already seen those you know, ads, you hit them over uh, the head with for a week or not. So um, it's really hard to nail that flow of information to a customer um, like you used to be able to um, compared to, and, and I mean, yeah, I think they, they did over attribute, but still. It makes me think about content and how in this new environment, just sort of continually engaging people with content, whether that be through ads or probably more importantly, organically, um, really, really makes sense. How are you thinking right now about um, growth as it comes to organic versus paid? Yeah, so um, we put a lot of credence into paid, just like every other direct-to-consumer brand. And, you know, you have to play with that beast to be getting the consistent growth and reaching customers um, that you reaching customers deliberately with a, like the, the long arm of, of paid yeah. media forcing um, the issue. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, um, yeah, as far as organic coming into the mix, uh, it's super important and always will be. And it's something where 
you know, we have a PR agency and, you know, we like to be able to get into publications and be in listicles. Um, we also had kind of an initial early blog push for our site um, as an SEO and keyword tool and also just an educational tool for customers to come to the site. And it's actually coming back around where it's had enough time to mature and we've seen, okay, this organic content is super important. Um, and it's definitely time over time to add more information to our blog. And also I'm of the, this going back to this education question you had early on, um, I think not only adding to our educational resources on site will help us allow customers to navigate and self-educate, but it's also gonna be, again, that organic um, play where you start coming up naturally in searches and the ever-changing Google al algorithm may or may not give you a little bit more favor in the process. Yeah, I was I was on uh, Instagram Reels last night and I was just, for, for some reason, I, I don't know what happened, but I was only getting like four kinds of videos. And uh, it was like some superhero stuff. And then it was like this guy at Cold Stone, Cold Stone Creamery. He's just the ice cream guy. He's at Cold Stone Creamery. And he's getting fed to people every four videos for some reason. Like, And you think about the value that Cold Stone Creamery gets from that, like especially in this world where we can no longer retarget people over longer periods of time. I just feel like that top of funnel content, whether it's on Reels or whether it's on TikTok, really this like this immediate vertical video is just going to become so important to brand sustained growth over time. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. And also it's kind of hard for a, a young brand or a small brand to spend time and energy and kind of put all the work into outreach into getting these organic videos because you just don't see that direct return, which is what drives the engine of your growth. So, it can be hard to trust the fact that, yeah, you're going to need that type of content in the future. And, oh, God, what was the name of that 15-minute TV thing that flopped super hard? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, I, I, I forget the name of the app, but it was like everyone wants these, you know, short 15-minute right? movies or whatever. And no, then, people want 15-second <laughs> movies, actually. And then the, the <laughs> pandemic hit, that thing crashed. But I think with that... TikTok really filled that space um, yeah. of that like short, super short form content that I think people did crave and were looking for. Um, I think that 10, 10 minute video, 15 minute video, just wrong timing for those guys. But to get back to your question, um, we are currently, uh, me and my dad, who's the co-founder are talking about this concept of TikTok made me buy it. You know, the TikTok yep. made me buy it concept I think is super powerful um, and you really can't go out there and start making ads on TikTok and like asking creators to make a specific ad video and expect it to blow up I think it's all about giving those types of creators on reels and TikTok free range give them your product let them do whatever they want to talk to their audience and let it organically show up in someone's feed and that's how your name gets in someone's mouth you know, that's how you get a click onto your website and that's going to feed your lookalike audience for website visitors and add to carts. And it's just part of that, you know, loop. So I think there is a lot of value in it. Totally. Now you and your father have such a great founder story and you, I know you've talked about it on a lot of podcasts. You've got a lot of press on it essentially. How do you, le how else do you leverage that founder story across your sort of growth plans? Yeah. So, um, do you want the TLDR version of it for this? or do Yeah, you sure. To... Okay. <laughs> so my dad and I, um, I've worked with and for my dad for 15 years. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's a dot-com expert. Um, and at one point I was at an impasse about to get an MBA uh, in my career and about to get an MBA. And he said, you know what, Thomas, we've always wanted to work together. You know, let's start this brand together. And it, it was the days, which was totally bizarre. But anyway, fast forward to us working together, kind of learning how to work together um, and really achieving a good connection um, on the business level. We utilize our relationship. Um, we used it kind of sparingly in the beginning because we're not like 
the type of people that want to put our face on everything and plaster our names. And like, it wasn't about us. It was about getting people to wash their butts because it's so much better than toilet paper. Um, and then we had people that were pushing us saying like, no, this, this story, this father, son story, it's super unique. You guys are good people. Um, people like to see you guys together and understand where it came from. And so now we leverage it. Uh, we're on the homepage and say, you know, these are the founders and people like to hear our little bit of story. Um, we've got a little about page that needs a little work. Uh, we also have been writing our emails in the kind of first person uh, tone of voice where it's coming from me or my dad. So it gives it a lot more character. Hey, this is a founder writing you an email. Um, so we, we have started to pick, pick up that ball and run with it. And um, one of the main areas where we carry that over was uh, we started creating long form video and we have a spot called the founder story. Uh, and it is our number one performing ad on YouTube. It's two and a half minutes. It's my dad and I talking about our story, talking about bidets and our model specifically. Um, and so that was a big eye opener for us to realize like, okay, yes, you can be modest, but also like take advantage of this story because people seem to, to like where you're coming from. Yeah, I could see it going well across any of these channels that we're talking about. Uh, when so talk about when YouTube came in. Did you were you uh, focused on YouTube from the beginning, or is that something that you've added in more recently? Yeah, so I would say YouTube. We're actually this is our three year birthday today. Um, so oh nice, yeah, congratulations, so, thanks. Um, so I would say about halfway through, so a year and a half in, um, it came to the forefront, um, and so my dad actually works with a bunch of brands and we all sat down and excuse me hiccup we all sat down and we had a little meeting of the minds to say hey it's time for all of us to focus on youtube this is where kind of a lot of people are heading and here are some of the tools that we're going to be using so and then we all dispersed and did our own version of it and that is about the time where we started working on our long form video content instead of um, image based on Facebook. And it really has been a big channel for growth for Amigo because of the top of funnel traffic. It's just when you get someone to click through, they have a very high interest level on a YouTube video. Yep. And they've been educated by that longer form content to a degree, right? Yeah, absolutely. They've been educated. Um, if they if they watch it, then you know, you do get a lot of brand um, impact on them and gives them an idea of what you're all about, what your product's all about, um, and does a little bit of the lifting up front. So when they come to your site, they're kind of a little bit more familiar for what you're talking about. And you do you churn as much creative on YouTube as you do on Facebook? No, and also yes. So you don't need to make a new video entirely every couple of months. You know, you don't have to put out a brand new video, um, but it is important to make small adjustments with your creative. Um, different intros, different outros, cut up the segments a little bit, um, add different end cards with different call to actions, and that is more about keeping fresh creative for the YouTube algorithm rather than uh, keeping fresh creative for your audience because you constantly get new people looking at your content. But it is really mm -hmm. important to not create that creative fatigue um, for for the uh, the algorithm to really continue to serve your ads effectively. Nice. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, I, you can't not talk about this, you know, we've talked about your top of funnel, but, but what's your, your hook? And I wanted to ask specifically, like how important has being cheeky been to, uh, the hook of actually, you know, piquing people's interest and getting their attention in terms of like your language and things like that? Yeah. So it's a little bit different. So our main two platforms that we get our top of funnel traffic are, um, Facebook and YouTube. So on Facebook, that that headline content has been a little bit cheekier and more eye-catching because you do have to say something um, pretty loud to get someone's attention in their newsfeed. So, you know, talking about skid marks, 
kind of cheeky a little bit visceral that that is visceral it's on the it's on the edge of being too much especially for our brand mm -hmm. um but i mean in our long form video content it's more about um the humor side of it because you do have the audio piece and the visual piece you don't have to tell as much of a story with your words as much as you get to with your content so we don't really love to cross that line it's not our brand and the approach that we've um, taken for both Facebook and YouTube is, yeah, we're going to be a little bit funny because poop's funny. It's easy to make a poop and toilet joke. Um, but also, we don't want to gross you out. And we're just going to be real about the subject. Like, yeah, everyone poops. You got to get clean. Use water instead of toilet paper. Like, think about it for a second. So, um, yes, you need to be cheeky. And I don't think that you have to go too far in order to capture attention. Um, so we've, I think we've done a really good job of walking that line of education and funny without being gross. I love it. I think I'm just seeing an uh, AOC dress that just says "Wash your butt" <laughs> instead of "Tax the rich." I think, I think you could if you could work that meme into your into your ads. I will. Uh, tell, <laughs> that's that's great. You, you, you might do well. Today's episode is brought to you by Podcorn, the leading platform for podcast advertising. Podcorn uses tech and data to match brands to the right podcasters to create authentic ads that resonate with listeners. Whether you're looking to increase online sales, drive app installs, or get more leads, Podcorn can connect you with the right podcasters to drive business results today. Go to podcorn.com and start your podcast advertising campaign today. Uh, very cool. I wanted to jump over to podcasts. You have some interesting experience uh, running some some significant budget uh, across podcast ads, and I wanted to pick your brain on that a little bit. Can you can you talk a little bit about your your podcast experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so early on, I know I just said you know our two main top of funnel channels, Facebook and YouTube. Um, early on, we really thought podcast was going to be the channel that did it for us. Um, and our, our mindset here was, like I've said, bidets are a little bit weird to talk about and they're a foreign concept to a lot of people. So the way that my dad and I were figuring out that people were more comfortable hearing about bidets was from a friend, me talking to my friend, educating them, telling them that it's not as weird as you think it is. And so we took that concept and of hearing it from a friend. And we said, all right, who do people listen to? Influencers, yes, they don't really use their voice as much. Podcast hosts, though. So if you have a dedicated audience that listen to you every week, I mean, that person kind of becomes your buddy. Like, they're not your buddy, but you're their buddy. And um, that is the type of connection we wanted to utilize and, and take advantage of to get this message across that the days are great. So... When we started out with Omigo, we did a, a pretty big, significant podcast push. Um, and I think we were on a dozen shows for several months and narrowed it down to about half a dozen for um, a couple more months after that. Um, but every one of our podcast hosts, it was required that they get an Omigo, install it, and use it before they do any reads. Because that is where the authenticity was going to come from for us. So that's how we... Um, got started in podcast. Uh, I like, it's an interesting thing. You, you have to have that other layer of influencer, uh, you know, sort of touch points when you literally have to have to get them to install something mm -hmm. uh, in their home. How, how was that process for, for managing that? Did how to go? For managing, getting people to install it? Yeah, just that, that whole process of finding the right influencers and then and actually getting them to install it. Was it a challenge or was it easier than I'd think? Uh, it's easier than you think. And that's uh, one of the misconceptions, right? Is that, oh man, this bidet, it's going to be hard to install. But in fact, it's designed deliberately so that anyone can install it. And we've got great videos on it. So there's a step-by-step nice. -step guide and it's really not that hard. And you can tell once someone's installed it and use it on a phone call because, you know, they they become evangelists pretty much immediately if they've never used one before. They're like, oh my God. This is amazing. Why haven't I done this before? I recall. So it's <laughs> it's pretty easy to know whether or not someone installed it. Nice. Okay. So you've got you've got this test going. You've got them running. Uh, how did it back out for you? Um, pretty bad at first. 
Yeah, so uh, first, there there wasn't that direct return like I've spoken of that allows you to say, all right, we're making a flat or I mean above a flat row as, and this is a great channel for us. We're getting a lot of direct response. Um, people are using our vanity codes. People are uh, coming to the vanity URLs. Uh, that just wasn't the case for us. It was really hard to attribute our um, visitors and revenue to individual podcasts because the vanity URLs just weren't being used. The vanity codes just weren't being used. Um, and even in our post-purchase survey, um, we didn't get a huge lift in that podcast section for people's responses. Um, so we had to back out of about half of them initially. Uh, the other half, um, we stayed on because while we weren't able to attribute it directly, there was an obvious lift in traffic when we did we did air these podcasts. And so by eliminating half, we were able to see, okay, we just cut this budget in half, but we're still seeing a lift in traffic and a lift in revenue, even though we can't say it came directly from these people. So it wasn't something where we said, poured gas on the fire. We had to pull back from where we started and then kind of slowly see if we could figure it out. And even then it was just not the return on ad spend that allows you to keep something running uh, indefinitely. So we had to turn it off. Um, so that's how it kind of went in the beginning. Nice. And then how has it been sort of like, you know, post pandemic uh, yeah. with, with bidets and, and specifically related to like, yeah. Yeah. So um, thanks for asking. I forgot to mention that. Yes, it did taper off. Um, but then we did start to see a post-purchase response several months down the line. So um, the timeline is Q3, Q4, we had, or Q3, we had a dozen, Q4, we had a half a dozen, and then it trickled to two, one or two in, in Q1. Um, and we had to kind of shut that tap off because it just wasn't panning out for us. And then as the pandemic hit, everyone was scared. We were afraid. We had no idea what was going to happen. Some lunatic started hoarding toilet paper and caused a mass, a mass panic in the United States. Of, and then a toilet paper shortage, which um, was probably the best thing that ever happened to our brand. Terrible thing to happen to the country, just the pandemic in general. Um, but for us... Well, if there's no toilet paper, you got to clean your butt somehow. And people started turning towards the bidet. So what happened um, in the month of, what was it, May? Um, we saw a huge influx in sales. I mean, I've said this before on, on different podcasts. It was Black Friday every day for seven days. And then it slowed down a little bit. And then we actually sold out a product. Uh, but what we saw in our post-purchase survey was a huge jump in podcast attribution. Um, and we hadn't been running podcasts for uh, months. So it was a, a true testament to the fact that you can hear about a brand for the first time on a podcast, sit on that knowledge, and then once something pushes you to buy, uh, you know, you've already got them, you've heard it from a trusted source, you go back to the website that you heard, and that's, that's where you make that uh, informed and um, in this case, desperate purchase, but still, uh, we'll take that. <laughs> what a what an interesting uh, anecdote! Just to that that power that you get from podcasts, like when, when you sit with someone for a couple times a week or one time a week for mm -hmm. for an hour or two, you know, you do you just you, you end up sort of like trusting you know the brands that are introduced to you through that format. That's that's mm -hmm. really cool to see that that type of return. And it's crazy that it happened through something where toilet paper became this national scare. Um, like what, what are you seeing now in, in the market are like, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, um, just sort of generally, I, I know there's talks of runs of things. Um, you know, what, what are you seeing now in the market in terms of, uh, like the buyer's journey with your product? Yeah. So, um, I believe firmly that the bidet came from subculture to kind of Nor more normalized and in the zeitgeist for long enough that it became something 
unforeign. People started hearing a lot about bidets during that month. I think, I mean, we've got more PR from that month and a half than, uh, you know, the two, the year and a half before and this past year combined. So it really were bidets kind of blew up for us and it normalized the concept of washing over wiping. Um, yep. So we did see a new normal afterwards and um, we, we've been trying to figure out exactly the right way to educate people still since, but um, I will say that people are more receptive to the concept of a bidet um, mm -hmm. and it, it hasn't been the same since. And I don't think it's going to be the same again. It's, it's a upward trajectory right now. How do you view competitive, like, you know, with this upward trajectory of the space, you're going to see more competitors. Mm -hmm. um, I know Tushy's been around, been around for a long time as well. H how do you see the, the, the competitors in the space currently? Yeah, I think Tushy's been around for, I think, twice as long as us or so, maybe three, three more years than us. Um, and they have been uh, pretty instrumental in the, the, the bringing of bidets to the United States. Um, you know, they use a very strong tone. I think it can be a bit over the top at, at times, mm. um, but it, it's working for them because they make natural PR waves. You know, they use, you know, there was a big run about how they weren't able to, their, their ad got canceled for the subway and, um, because it was too obscene and then SNL picked it up and like they made a wave about the days then and, um, they do some outlandish advertising that gets them picked up and run with. And people love to talk about that kind of um, uh, a little bit obscene and jarring type of advertising. And it's really brought bidets to a different level in the United States just by themselves. So um, congratulations to them and good job for, for educating all these people and bringing that um, type of awareness to the product. Um, and bring a peer disruptor, you know, and I, and yeah. I, I think about it, you know, with them being, you know, one of the first to the space, it's a really bold move to go as brash as they have, I mm -hmm. think, but it's the way that, you know, they've kind of, as you say, they kind of generated their own waves, which has mm -hmm. been a pretty smart play. Yeah. And then I imagine there's copycats as well. And there, you know, there's other people who kind of fast follow there's, you know, AliExpress products. How do you think about like the field on Amazon? Do you guys sell on Amazon? Uh, yeah, we actually got on Amazon uh, a couple of months ago and it's been a nice steady revenue stream for us not crazy but um it's really hard to compete with those aliexpress guys um that that popped up and i mean during the pandemic this space tripled i want to say and then the months following you could see a lot less of those little guys that just dropped off yeah and they were drop shipping you're like okay yeah we've made our money and we're gonna back out of the space and it was funny because you'd go to their websites and it would be a carbon copy of Hello Tushy um, because they were the leader in this space. Um, so they probably got sued out of the space, um, but also they just weren't there for the long haul. They were trying to grab um, some money while they were in the news, um, which is unfortunate because I think a lot of those products are inferior, not made as well. They just, they can be kind of chintzy. Um, which is too bad, but the space has um, expanded greatly. I mean, our paid campaigns um, have, the price has steadily increased on um, our AdWords campaigns uh, because the big players like Lowe's and Home Depot and even and now Amazon are starting to advertise because they're realizing that there is, um, you know, a market for, the, for these products and Kohler's always been there and Toto's always been there. Um, and now you get a couple more little guys fighting for the space too. Um, and so the landscape has definitely changed in the past couple of years, but I feel really comfortable where we are, you know, a couple of years under our belt, great product. People love us a ton of good reviews. Um, we're getting a lot of good referrals from family and friends as a response in our post-purchase survey. So that really tells nice. me we're doing something right. And when you're on a mission, it's, you know, it, it's up to you to, you, you, you know, you want to really help the world have cleaner butts. So I, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. Oh yeah. I really want you to have a clean butt. Everyone needs to have a cleaner butt. It makes life better.
I love it. Uh, one last little thing here. I, I, it might be too early to talk about this yet because we're only halfway through the month. But uh, we discussed that you were doing a little test in linear television. And I was wondering if you had any early returns on how that was going. Or it might be too early considering podcasts you know, can last six months. Yeah, so we're in the testing phase for TV. And it's only been a week and a half. Um, and we've only been on about six channels. So uh, it is, I mean, it's just so interesting to be on TV as a direct-to-consumer brand and kind of, it feels like you're jumping back in time and going to linear cable. I mean, we're talking spectrum. We're not talking Netflix or even YouTube TV. Uh, we're talking like a set-top box. So um, the results are, they're mixed. I mean, truly they are mixed results yeah. on what channel is going to be successful, what time of day is successful. So uh, we're learning a lot and I think we'll be able to turn some knobs and dial it in. Um, but it's, it's too, it is too early to tell for sure whether or not we're going to stay there. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I've been having these, you know, as we've been talking, I think of uh, the Drops. Uh, we did a podcast with the head of acquisition from Drops, um, mm -hmm. a, a detergent company. And just the way that they, you know, use their their founder in, in humorous ads. I feel like with you and your father, there's a real potential to do <laughs> more content. Um, it, I'm going back to this crazy uh, SNL commercial from the 90s. Did you, have you ever, did you ever see the, the fake SNL commercial for the Love Toilet? Oh, oh gosh, people post a, a gif of those on our ads all the time, but I, I, I have I seen it. I think you and your dad should do the bro bidet <laughs> and you should do, make a fake product that is a, like a dual bidet for people. And I think you could get some, so you could make some of your own waves on that one. Gosh. Yeah. We do need to do some more outlandish stuff, him and I, cause we're pretty hilarious when we get together. Yeah. I, I can, I can tell that I'd like, I'd like to meet you. I'll have to have your dad on next time as well. <laughs> Um, that's fantastic. So here's the, here's a question I'm really curious for someone that has, uh, you know, had a lot of success across a lot of different channels. I, I was one, you know, if we were to give you a $50,000 grant right now, uh, what would you, where in your marketing plan would you insert that for uh, maximum value? I would take that and I would go after Twitch and YouTube channels and hosts. I would go small and I would give as much product away as I could with as low a CPM um, added um, financial bonus and just try and flood this, I think, untapped influencer influencer space that, that people just aren't taking advantage of. Um, yeah, I would go and I would I would spend some money on these smaller influencers on Twitch, YouTube, I would go into TikTok um, and then see where else that took me. But yeah, I'll take 50. You got 50K laying around for me? Yeah, well, we're working on it. Um, <laughs> but Twitch is a great call. And I think it's 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 one of those things where people don't, you know, not everyone realizes that movies or that video games are like way bigger than movies and only going to continue to exponentially sort of dwarf them in terms of the public imagination as, mm -hmm. as the, the generation kind of ages out. And uh, And so there's just, I think there's just a massive opportunity there. Have you done anything with Twitch yet? Not yet. On the calendar. Not yet. Yeah. There is our customer service lead. Shout out to Bob has been pushing me to do it because he's a big Twitch um, guy and he's been he's been hounded me to get on Twitch and he thinks it's a great channel and uh, I'm listening to him. I got to get out there. There was I know we discussed previously that you had actually prepared an opportunity for our listeners to to try a bidet if they hadn't at, at a discount. Were you able to provide that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks so much for having me on. You can go to myomigo.com. That's M-Y-O-M-I-G-O.com. And um, we're giving away 20% to anyone that's listening right now. You can use the code DTC20. Simple, nice. DTC20. Go take 20% off. Start washing your butt. It'll change your life. And uh, you can thank me later. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.